due to the way that we are trained, are sort of put in this position where if we don't feel, I sort of put in this position where we, we might not feel worthy being in the spaces that we're in if we don't undergo this training that is so heavily focused on, on Western methodologies. Um, and that has always rubbed me the wrong way. And I know that it has traumatized a lot of, a lot of artists of color in this industry because theater has always been a, a, a global art form. And I think it's, I think it's, it's for all of us to, to explore and be uncomfortable and think beyond what we know or what, what we are taught is the right way of being on stage. Because I, I, I was born this way. This is what I know. So if it's not, if, if it's not gonna be accepted in the spaces I, that, that I occupy, then maybe it's time to venture to new ground mm. or make my own spaces. Hello everyone and welcome to Chai with Rai, a life and culture podcast diving into the mindset and business of being a creative. Hi, I'm your host Rai and each week I bring you a guest or a fruitful message from the creative industry all while sipping and spilling some hot chai. Now if you haven't done so, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. If you love this podcast and are listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible or wherever you are streaming this podcast from, if you could do me a kind favor and make sure to rate the podcast down below and share on your stories on social and spread the word tag us it organically grows the show and connects us with listeners who haven't tuned in before and overall as i always say it just shares the love also if you haven't done so already you can now become a patron aka a supporter of chai with rye by signing up on patreon for five pounds or as i love saying it in this accent five dollars and fifty cents each month your subscription will help support the show but also get you exclusive behind the scene footages and some extra juicy things i will put the link for the patreon channel as well as anything else mentioned in the episode in the description so make sure to check that out but without further ado let's warm up our delicious cuppers let me know what you're sipping on as you stream this episode and let's dive into today's episode with director producer artist just a wonderful soul Jordi m carter i don't know it's okay it's all right you move and you move on and like we're putting it out in the universe right good energy are we i am for you i think you need to i appreciate the sentiment yeah can I just say, um, this is the first time I am seeing you without a hat, but I'm still seeing you. Oh my God. I've never in, how many years? I've known you since 2021, yet never seen your hair. Yeah, a lot of people haven't. Wow. A lot of people, I cut it off, um, when was it? The beginning of May, because yeah. I was just, it was, it's just been in a perpetual, like, ugly state. <laughs> so I've cut it off, and I'm regrowing it, but now I get head cold. That's the bandana. How many times a month do you need to go to the barber? Oh, I haven't been to the barber in, in a very long time. Okay. I just prefer to let it grow out. Were you going to get like box braids? No, just afro. Okay. But my hair grows incredibly slowly. Rosemary oil. Yeah. With black castor oil. Yeah. yeah. I've tried that. <clears throat> so that usually really helps. Mm. There will be a reveal. <laughs> with your blonde highlights and like dreadlocks. My sister told me to <laughs> dye my hair blonde and I'm like, are you fucking no, crazy? No, don't do that. Of course not. Don't do that. Of course not. Pink. Dude, do Frank Ocean. I, I'm not... Like a pale pink. I'm not that out there. Yet. You never know where... Think... Yeah, but you never know where life takes you. I don't envision my life taking me to a point where I dye my hair like pink. Pastel pink. I mean, you are an actor. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Okay, let me play a clip, shall I? Oh gosh, that was that was how many years ago? Yeah, thank you. And you retract. I haven't acted since 2020. Well, you might in the future. You never know. We'll see. Okay, great. Should we get into? Let's this? do it. Okay, great. Let's do it. So five segments. We're gonna start with warm up games, mm -hmm. um, like we always do in rehearsals. Mm. The games are called Can You Improv Though, and they're set to times. So there's gonna be a couple of questions, and you have to answer them. Mm do everything to them within that time period. Okay. So the first question is going to be within five seconds and you're going to have to answer it within five seconds. Okay. Does that makes sense? So I'm going to ask you a question mm -hmm. and then you answer that in five seconds. Okay. Any more, any more ex the information that I need no. to know? Good, got Great. it. That's <laughs> it. Okay. I have been watching lots of like end of the world films and escapism films Ooh. for the past couple of years. And I find it really interesting to ask this question to people mm. that what current skill sets do we possess if we were ever put in that situation? So like if we ever watch like, for example, like Nope mm -hmm. or like World War Z, 
and we have to save ourselves and humanity. You would just be like, I would do this, I would do that. Mm. So I want you to envision that you are end of world. Okay. okay. Humanity has turned into zombies. Okay. Okay. What current three skill sets do you possess to save yourself and bring back humanity within five seconds? List as many skills as you can. Go. Okay. Long legs, um, problem solving skills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, this is awful. Um, I'd like to just pick those two quickly. Okay. Before you were. What are your long legs going to do? Because um, he can't run. Why can't I run? I thought you had knee problems. No, I'm a great runner. Oh, okay. I just haven't run in a while. Okay, great. Yeah. So you would run? Yeah. Yeah, or swim. Mm-hmm. And then problem solving. Problem solving. <laughs> I'm really good at identifying problems and solutions to problems. So the problem is <laughs> that humanity is turned into a zombie. What is the solution to that? Okay. Um, on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> on the spot. You're I'm really... dying. <laughs> I'm not dying. I'm not dying. I have faith in my problem solving skills. If I were to be in an underworld situation, yeah. I'm sure I could. <clears throat> I don't. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Should we leave it? Let's, yeah, let's yeah. leave it there. Let's, let's ponder oh, this. Oh, goodness, what a game. Yeah, what a game. I think you should ask this of other people. Yeah. Because I'm it really doing... shows, like, what would happen in that scenario. So, like, you could even be, like, if we were stranded in wilderness mm. and no signal, no nothing, like, what life skill sets do we possess mm. to be able to survive? So, like, people could be, like, oh, I'm a great hunter or I'm a great gatherer. Do you know what I mean? Okay, yeah. So, like, these are great skill sets because I choose my friends now according to skill sets wow. at my company. So wow. if, you, if you cannot do any of those things, okay. I'm just like, you're dead. Okay, okay. As soon as it happens. Cool. Yeah, you need cool. to be surrounded by people. No, that's bad. That, that. that can live yeah. in those dire situations. All right, your 10 seconds question. In an interview slash feature you did for Get Into Theatre, you state, and I'm quoting you for this, one thing I have always been good at is breaking the rules how we can change the landscape of who sits in the audience. Mm. Now, taking that last sentence out and getting inspiration from the fact that you love breaking rules and that's something that you're good at, Mm -hmm. in 10 seconds, list as many things where you have actually broken the law or done something where you have broken the rules. Ready? I'm going to count to 10. Go. Okay. Um, What we talked about before we started recording. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> is that breaking um, the law in the UK? Well, yes. You need to move to Europe. Um, Europe is very much open to those things. Fair, I didn't know that. Yeah. Actually, no, no. And to Mexico. Be, yeah. To be fair, Europeans are very out there. Yeah, we um, are. What else have I done to break the rules? Um, just give me one more thing. Is this in theatre or just outside? Anything. In life even. You could have stolen. Ooh. Or you could have, uh, I don't know. In a theatre production when people told you not to talk, you talked in the audience, you had your phone out and you were chewing gum. I don't know, I'm just throwing things out there. Oh, I'm very good at using my phone on when I'm watching shows that I'm not really invested in. Yes, I've seen Um, that in action. Have you? Yeah, we did that at one of the Young Big Shots. Oh shit, I I can't say this. Oh gosh, oh gosh. I mean, I can. Sorry. No, as in like, it wasn't a show at the Young Vic. It was a show we got oh, through oh, 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 the oh, Young Big oh. Fresh Direction yeah, yeah. program we okay. went to see. Okay, I think and I, I saw that in action. Well. And it was you, and it was what's her name? Ugh, you were sitting next to her, and you both just were like chatting. Where in London was this? I'm not gonna say the name. <laughs> you don't have to say the name of theatre. Where? No, just... but I, if I say the location, that is that that will give away the theatre. Was it near Victoria Station? I'm not gonna say anything that will incriminate you and I, what? unless you want me to. Why not? It's a free country. <laughs> yes, it was near Victoria Station. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was Pia or Tia that you were sitting next to, because those would be the only two that you would always sit next to. Fair. You sat next to me at the bush for once, and you hit me. Did I? At the cola nut, because there's that audience interaction part where I said, and everybody else was quiet. Oh my god. I thought that was cute. I was very into it. That was a cute show. That was a very good show. That was a really good... And she's gone on... um, She's in the West End now, isn't she? The the second lead, who was the musician. She's in a new Jamie Lloyd Webber show, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 She's done brilliant. Mm. So, your last question is... Your 30 seconds question. 
All right. Mm -hmm. In 30 seconds, I'm just going to throw things to you. Before I do uh, the question to you, I'm just going to list some credits that you have had recently. Okay, ready? Yeah. Uh, assistant producer for Off the Cut at The Young Vic. Yeah. Assistant producer for Saturn Returns at South Bank Centre and Northern School of Contemporary Dance. Mm -hmm. Associate producer at Gateway Arts, director of The Hivy mm -hmm. by Hackney Showroom, director of Black Terror for Guildhall School of Music and Drama, mm -hmm. director of the Government Inspector at the Lyric, and lastly, in May, at the tender age of 23, you <laughs> became the tender age, might I just say. This the is last age. year, mind you. Yeah, last, mind you. In the tender age and so many tiny years that you've been on this planet, you were named <laughs> the inaugural co-artistic director and chief executive officer at Boundless Theatre alongside Lamisha Ruddock mm -hmm. as co-executive director. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> so fair to say that um, you know a lot about storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. So in this game of improv, pretend I'm a commissioner, mm -hmm. which you should be able to because we've all done funding applications and we've talk all talked about with commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to pitch me a story for your play to get commissioned. What is the highest stage that you would like a show for you to direct or produce at? I actually don't know if it would be in this country, but if hypothetically... Yeah. Yeah, you know what, why not? Old Vic. Old Vic. Yeah. Okay, so you're pitching a story to the Old Vic. Mm -hmm. Cool. I am a commissioner who wants to take to the Old Vic, but you need to sell it to me. So it's going to be an original story. You're going to make it up on the spot, mm -hmm. even though you might have a story already. But the only terms and conditions are you have to use these three words in your pitch to me within 30 seconds. Okay? Mm -hmm. So your three words to include in this pitch are mess. Mess. Because you always call me a mess. I love that word. Orange. 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 And love. Because I, I want love. you to find love. So in, in three, two, one, pitch. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. We're seven seconds in. I'm pitch. really not good with improv. Um, so this story is one of, one of, one of much mess um, between a group of friends who are trying to find love amongst each other, be, beyond their friendship circle. Um, Five seconds left. And they like, they like um, orange juice. I don't know. Wow, that was awful. That um, was so bad. I don't think you're ready for the old Vic yet. No, no. I must say. Absolutely not. But I like your energy. Oh my goodness. I really like your energy. So we might see where it leads to. Please. We might see where it leads to. I'd like to do a public service announcement that I'm not good at improv and I'm not good with being put on the spot. <laughs> okay. So, so please, got cut it, us got some it. Don't, don't, Yeah, exactly. Let's be nice people. Let's not. Let's not make a sound by out of this. Let's not put it up on Instagram. Thank you. And let's not make a thing out of it, which I will. Not you listing the thing. Oh my god. <laughs> that I will be doing with all. Of See, this. now this is why I call you a mess. <laughs> oh god. Who's the messiest person that you know? The messiest person I know, without naming names, unless you want to, that you personally know and have a good relationship with, but they're just messy for like. But I have a good. I'm not usually. Good. I don't usually have a good relationship with most people. Wow. Um, is that why we don't talk a lot? I'm joking. The messiest person I know. Oh, I, I know. I know. Okay. But, Would you like to name and shame them? No. Okay. Because I have decorum. Okay. Would you like to message them and just, can you message them after this and just be like, I just want you to know that I adore you and you are messy, but I adore you. And just say that. Yeah. I mean, messy for me comes from a place of love. Yeah. So yeah, I don't mean anything mean by it. Okay, cool. But yeah. can you message them? Sure. Okay, cool. And just let me know what they say. Mm -hmm. Be promise. Yeah. Be still. promise. Let's do it. That's, that was a sturdy ring that you. Um, all right. Well, we're going to get into our deep, meaningful conversation. So, um, part of the end of the interview, I do something where I ask you a question mm. and you can choose which one to answer. And one of those questions is you can ask the next guest a question. Mm. And then that will be the first question that I'll ask the next guest. So I don't know if you know um, dialect and accent coach Gurkin Kaur. She asked you this question without oh. knowing anything about this. Okay. And I'm really intrigued to know this. Mm. So when was the most euphoric or happiest you were in your job? 
Is that a misnomer? Because I currently don't have one. Um, <laughs> no, your job as like regardless of if you're tied no, to anything, like, yeah. you have a job. Oh my god! When I got DYCP, I don't know if that counts. Yeah. When I got DYCP, because that was during the end. That was near the end of my tenure at Boundless, and I was just thinking about what's next because I had applied the round before that round and I didn't get it. So this time I was like, okay, let's just go for the full twelve and see what happens. Yeah. But obviously having to wait. What was it like three months yeah, did, for a response? Yeah. And then knowing that I got it, that I'd be able to spend a year just doing what I wanted to do was definitely great. I think I screamed in my room when I saw the email. Yeah, I'd have to say that was most euphoric. Since we're talking about DYCP, mm. that was going to be one other question, which is I know what your DYCP is about. Mm. It's on your website as well. <laughs> for people that they want it? to find out. Oh my God, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But I'm really interested for you to answer this since we're talking about that. What is a DYCP about? Mm. It's finished now or are you still continuing it? Because it can be for as long or as little. Yeah, as so my finish is in October. Okay, great. What have your recent revelations of it been for you personally mm. and as a practitioner? What is DYCP about for mm. people who just want to know? And why is it so challenging but also important for artists? Mm. So a lot of questions. Cool. There. So, DYCP, so Developing Your Creative Practice is a fund offered by Arts Council to, I don't know how many artists per round um, to spend time, uh, like putting together a project or a proposal um, to develop their creative practice over an extended period of time. And what I had proposed to do was spend a year working on my craft as a director in a more intellectual capacity so thinking more about anti-racist approaches to the craft of directing and also what indigenous approaches uh, to directing might look like i think also for context it's good to know that i am very how do, how do i say this <laughs> correctly i am not really interested in tired playbooks from the canon of supremacy so <laughs> the the stanislavskis and the chekhovs and the and the Brecht, like the, the Western traditional canon, I have never really been interested in. It's always like bothered my spirit that I think in degree training programs or other training programs within this industry, it's so heavily focused on Western traditions of theatre making and acting and performance. And as part of my degree, actually, one of my dissertations was solely focused on global outlooks on actor training and thinking about especially like black cultural approaches and modes of creative expression that we can use as anti-racist frameworks in rehearsal rooms and in, in theatre practice. That was a whole spiel. But yeah, I guess in essence, my project is about really exploring, exploring and interrogating actor training methodologies, theatre making methodologies that come from the global south and the global majority, um, and especially from uh, African and Caribbean diasporic heritages. Mm. Why do you think before, actually now I'm going to dive into your project, which is, now oh, let's talk about, I think let's talk about why DYCP8 is challenging and why it's also imperative for people. I think it's, I think it's, cha I remember when I first applied for it, I really had no idea what I was doing and I was very coy and very modest about what I had achieved in my career thus far. And I think in some of the, um, some of the application sec sections, they ask you to be very explicit in, in like what you've done in your career thus far, what you intend to do with, with this money or this time and how it's going to develop. I think it's hard to, it can be hard sometimes to clearly articulate that. Mm. Even, even beyond applying for DYCP, for example, but I think in DY, with DYCP, it's hard because you don't know what they're looking for. You don't know what, what, what they're looking for in terms of what constitutes a, a, a winning application or a winning proposal, for example. Um, and the feedback, sorry to anyone from Arts Council who's listening, that feedback <laughs> is very whack. And the feedback that I got in my, in my first rejection actually was of no use to me whatsoever. Mm. I was just like, <laughs> okay, I applied for less than I wanted. So let me just go for the full time. I was being very delusional when I went back into that process. I was like, okay, let me just take some time and really think about exactly how I want to use this money, how I want to develop as an artist and really articulate what my creative practice is. And also think about what I want to do beyond that. Mm. 
I don't know if this is answering your question at all. Um, but I think it's, it's really important that artists are given the time and the resources and the funds to be able to make work on our own terms and to take that time to seek whatever kind of professional development we, we know that we need. Mm. But it's so, it's so competitive and I think it's become more popular over the years and it's become a lot more oversubscribed. It's easy to get a lot more no's than yeses. But I think in essence, it's a wicked opportunity and it's been wicked for me. I think it's a wicked opportunity to just like delve deep and even take time away from working. It's been nice to step away from the industry, kind of. That's sort of clickbait, I really haven't done that. Um, You're not uh, fully operational in yeah. your, in your um, title. Yeah. You're yeah, much yeah. more researching mm. and much more inhaling as opposed to outputting, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think for me, what's been good mainly because I haven't studied directing or producing at all. I just sort of learned it on the job. I think what's been nice in focusing on my directing is that I don't feel any deference to the, the practices that, that directing students are, are taught. Like I, don't really, I, don't really, I really don't care mm. about like Western ways of, of, of making work and telling stories because there have been so many stories over the years of drama school students who have come out the other end who just feel like they're, they're like a carbon copy of what such and such drama school thinks an actor or a director or producer should be. And I think when I was born, the box was just sort of torn up, which is why I think I've always been good at breaking rules. Like it's, it's, it's served me well and I think it's always been in my best interest to diverge and just follow my own, my own path because it's led me down a path where I can explore these practices from Brazil or from the Caribbean or from Africa or from even South, South, Southeast Asia that I am constantly thinking about how I can incorporate that into my rehearsal rooms or how I uh, interpret or analyse scripts or um, how I realise things visually through set design, for example. So it's opened my eyes, at least, in a way that I, I don't think even from when I was studying for my degree, the, the Western canon could have ever given me. Can I interrupt your thought yeah. to ask a question? Like, what would be a comparative example that you would offer? Like, for example, I find, like, um, folk stories to have so much more of a broken form mm. of telling something yeah. and much more have an inherent joyfulness mm. than... I find what British foreign theatre is taught, mm. like it needs, it needs to have an act structure, it yeah. needs to have an arc or it needs to have some things. And, it, and if it doesn't fit that, well, you need to create a form. Whereas mm. I find like certain folk stories or certain forms, that those just aren't the ways that they're done. Yeah. And also like game playing, yeah. like music structure, dance structure, they're just not taught in mm. that same way that they are here sometimes. Yeah. So I would be intrigued to know is like, have you come across a practitioner or something right now that has been a revelation for you that you're like, the next time I am in a rehearsal room, I will for sure be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hip hop theatre pedagogy is a pedagogy by Cassie Johnson, who is an American based theatre director and pedagogue and teacher. Um, and hip hop theatre pedagogy um, is really, really coming off the back of hip hop culture and how that has uh, assimilated uh, and, and framed black culture in the States, at least since. In, since its inception in the early 50s. And what that does is it gives artists exercises, so like the five elements of hip hop, like emceeing, uh, breaking graffiti. I don't really know this, I don't know who they to. But like emceeing exercises where students are given the space to create self-generated work instead of relying on a, like Shakespeare, monologue as part of an audition process, for example. Having those exercises that are, that you know are in tune with your cultural identity. Because I think hip hop has been such, a, such an important part of at least black American culture. And we can see how that's sort of been assimilated in, in black British culture over the years. Those exercises and techniques and methodologies where we are in a room and we are given the opportunity to create our own spoken word or create our own stories or create our own monologues from our own lived experiences um, and find our own iambic pentameters in, within those, I think is 
for me, has been so generative whenever I've thought about hip-hop pedagogy in my rehearsal rooms and when I think about warm-up exercises and things like that. Hip-hop, that's been the main thing. Yeah. But then also in, ter in terms of forms and structures, I have to say choreo poems, which has come from God Bless Us All and Suzaki Shangje, who created for, for Colour Girls, who considered suicide such when the rain goes enough. Oh my God, such a good show. Right? Such a good story. And such like, a good story. I've seen the stage version and I've seen the film version. Yeah. And I think like, yeah. Yeah. Kills me every time. It's amazing when I, where, when you open a book or a choreo poem that's, that's been written um, and you, like there, there'll be some choreo poems where there are words literally all over the page. Yeah. And it's up to the performer to liberate those words off the page in the way that they see fit, I think is really interesting and in how it deconstructs the well-made play, which I'm so sick of. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really fascinating way because it incorporates spoken word and movement and dance and poetry in such a profound way. And I think For Coloured Girls has led the way, especially for black women who time and time again are so underrepresented and underrecognized in this industry. Um, to tell their stories in the ways they see fit um, because, you know, black women have held us down for, since the beginning of time. Um, and I think what Entezaki has been able to do is immortalise that in, in this form where we don't have to come in with a set, oh, I'm coming in with Alexander Technique, for example, or I'm coming in thinking, oh, there's going to be like Brechtian or, or post-dramatic. Like, I think that's so wanky. Sorry, excuse my French. I think choreo poetry is such a beautiful way of liberating true stories. It's more raw, it's yeah. more intuitive, it's more aligned to yeah. Um, yeah. your being. Exactly. And I think what most important, I think it comes from a place of soul and a place of feeling uh, yeah. um, and a place of spirituality, which I, on my own journey with for the last four years, am reckoning with that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think choreo poetry is one of my favorite forms. Can I ask about your DYCP, the, you know, the practicality of it, is that yeah. through research and workshops or is that through you going and shadowing? Like, what is the breakdown of it, if you don't mind me asking? So or it's a mixture of everything? So I'm, it's mainly courses. So I'm mainly doing courses, like there's a studio in, in America called the Black Acting Method Studio and they have two courses. So one is uh, like mental health and well-being for black creatives and exploring like black theatre history through time and placing the origins of theatre in Africa as opposed to Greece. And the other is Active Methods for the 21st Century. And that is, that, that's incorporating all these different acting methodologies from all parts of the world beyond the West. So that, that, that in and of itself has been amazing because I'm a massive bookworm and I love like reading and like breaking things down and putting things together again. I'm a Virgo, if you can't tell. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think the way that I process is by, I'm very kinesthetic in how I learn. So I like, like making notes and breaking things apart and putting them together. And what has been nice about this is that through this year, I have been able to make my directorial debuts at Lyric and I'm making one at Talawa in July. Is it Talawa? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I can use some of what I've learned already in how I'm, reviving classics through the lens of brown eyes, for example, or coming at a, a piece of new writing that, is, that, that sole purpose is to challenge con concepts of to toxic black masculinity, for example. So yeah, I think as I've gone through this journey of just like studying these courses, preliminary, on a preliminary level, it's been nice that things have come up through that that are really aligned with where I'm trying to go as a director. And then some things have included like workshops as well. I'm going to be heading to New York City. I was meant to head in April, but that didn't work out. Um, I was meant to head in July, but that didn't work out because I've got my television show. I mean, a good thing is like with Joe CP, you can like tweak things because yeah. it's literally about your own. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so now I'm thinking about going in September. And that's purely just to meet with American directors out there and some faculty from like different institutions. Um, and then to do some research at the Stromberg Center for Research in Black Culture, just so I can delve even deeper. So my question to you is this, which I think is very interesting, like within the UK government arts funding scenario is like external practices and even sometimes like external talent coming into the UK to do shows. There's always a very much of a conversation about how does this 
prolong or uplift the UK art scene. Mm. Is that something that you 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 came across or you were like no because that is how this is going to translate? I think because that is a massive thing. Like, yeah. how is this? Because at the end of the day, DYCP or any arts funding is being provided by the British government, yeah. and like, how are you, how is this going to change the landscape of British theatre or your mm. own practice as a British artist? I think what's interesting and very laughable about British theatre is <laughs> is the fact that British theatre or a lot of our stages are so heavily focused on producing American plays um, that delve into American history. If you do um, not know, there's a side eye happening right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, a heavy one at that. A heavy one um, at that. This country is so used to producing those plays with with so much rich history, um, but never want to delve into their own. Um, and I have had many a conversation about this with many an industry peer for many a year now. Um, and one thing I really wanted to do with my DYCP was to venture beyond just the, the West in general and take it back to at least my motherland, the islands and Africa and even venturing beyond that to find the resources and the ways of seeing the world and ways of creating our stories that would actually benefit people in this country um, and especially arts of colour because I think arts of colour due to the way that we are trained are sort of put in this position where if we don't feel are sort of put in this position where we we might not feel worthy being in the spaces that we're in if we don't undergo this training that is so heavily focused on on western methodologies um, and that has always rubbed me the wrong way. And I know that it has traumatised a lot of a lot of artists of colour in this industry. And what I wanted to do, like I am, I'm very big on giving back and paying forward and being of service in some way. And I knew that with my DOICP in getting all this knowledge in my practice as a director, but also intellectually as a human being, I'm constantly thinking as I'm reading through all these books and, and watching all these these videos, I'm like, how can I use this in this country so that we can finally get to a place where we are producing work on these stages that, act that accurately reflects the demographic in this country and the very sordid history that this country has become so good at concealing. Because mm. um, I think it's only fair that if we're producing American shows with American history, that Britain should finally, it's like the pot in the kettle. It's the pot in the kettle, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think if, if, we're, if it's so easy for us to produce plays from America, then we should really be focusing on our own. And I think new writing can, new writing is such an important tool, especially in this day and age now where Arts Council is like, if you're putting on politicised work, then we, we're going to restrict your funding. But there's so much knowledge out there and there's, there's so many ways that artists of all disciplines can tell their stories and produce their stories. It feels only right that I can make, I can contribute to that work. Mm. I'm intrigued to know the subconscious and conscious of your personal journey mm. versus, so like for example, when we're talking about male black experience, right? Mm. And in exploring that and wanting to storytell in a much more, for lack of a better word, because it's the only word that's coming to my head, like nuanced manner, mm. um, and championing like, championing new writing or creating more work and just exploring the gamut of that lens. What I'm interested to know are three phases, which is when you are balancing your subconscious conscious mm. morality, then there's the social cultural gambit mm. and then there's the industry gambit mm. of whether that is boxing or whether that is unboxing or whether that is standing. How does that look? And also from an organizational perspective, because you, you were a CEO and an artistic director. Uh, like, I also feel like having these conversations with artistic directors and programmers and CEOs of like a POC theater organization, that's a lot of weight on those small organizations like mm. Peck and Rye or mm. like Brixton or like Talawa, some of these places that are like championing great work yeah. to have to be able to tell so many things. Mm. Like, do those thoughts ever, like, overwhelm you to a point where you're just like, 
Oh, on a daily basis. But then how do you become a... Like, I was... We've had massive conversations about the fact I don't want, ever want to become a victim of those things. Yeah. I want to persevere and come out of that. I find it that those, those points that I was mentioning, they're very heavy sometimes to deal with. Mm. And sometimes by our peers are used as like little jabs against us and towards us mm. and then sometimes we need to hit those to get into spaces yeah take a moment to reflect <laughs> on Ooh. what was just said <laughs> it's, in, it's incredibly difficult it's incredible oh i i really don't know how to answer this question actually it's it's really hard it's really hard because industry was never built to be in service to people like us and that includes in organizational settings as well. And I think it's really easy sometimes to aim for a particular role, especially from a perspective such as ours, whilst knowing that we will have to face the repercussions of what our, what our body and what our presence represents and constitutes in certain spaces. Um, I think for me, the day that, Oh, how do I answer this? How do I answer this? <laughs> we can move on. No, I think this sure? is such an important question. Yeah. I think the day that I... The day that changed everything for me was June 2nd, 2020. Um, that was, I think that was Blackout Tuesday. And I was in second year. And I was the only black man on my degree course on both my subjects. And I'd realised the pattern. I'd realised the pattern of, like university drama courses or like drama school training programs is just the same, the same old white thing. When, and when you don't see yourself represented in the curriculum that you are paying to learn. It got to a point to, for me where I was like, something has to give. Something about Blackout Tuesday. I just, I just, I just lost it. I lost it. I, I, I was just in my room like in tears because it, it was those same, it was those same jabs, I think that you were just talking about, about like, for me, how I how I interpret that question is is being in spaces where you know you're gonna you're gonna face those jabs. Mm. And me, I'm I'm from South London. I say this all the time. It's one of my biggest personality traits. Growing up in Brixton and Streatham, all I knew was multiculturalism. Yeah. Um, and then when you're put in like other spaces, other spaces like a <laughs> PWI, for example, where you're the only one of your only one of your kind. That is so gross. Um, the only one that looks yeah, revealed. Yeah. Like, yeah. I get what you mean. And then you have something as momentous and as wildly nonsensical as a Blackout Tuesday, for example. I was just like, something, something clicked in my head, something broke in my head. And I think since then, I have, not that I've wanted to end up in, in the spaces that I have, but I've always ended up in those spaces and have been forced to confront those jabs and think about how I separate myself as a conscious being knowing how people see me because of my skin colour or because of how brazen I am about not, not caring about the status quo. And then thinking about, for example, or in an organisational setting, how am I being served in a way where I can be of service to, to, to this organisation as an entity to do the work it was designed to do? I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. I think you are. Um, it's, <laughs> Why do you say that? You I don't asshole? know. I always second guess myself with questions like this. It's, this, is, this is a really complex question. But also, this is the um, moment. This is what you're feeling. This yeah. is what's coming out. Like later on, of course, there'll be reflections. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, I should have said that, or I could have done this. Yeah. And that's yeah. a, you know, you save those thoughts and you deliver them. Yeah. Them, but let the words take you. Um, no, I think for a long time, I've always. Like my artistic identity has been so closely entwined with my personal identity and my cultural identity because for so long they were just, they were just the same thing. Mm. And then <laughs> realising that that's not how the industry works and that there's, there's a very sordid history of how people of colour have been treated in this industry. And also on a socio-cultural level, th th there's, there's, so, there, there's so many mirrors, there's so many... Um, they, they all parallel one another, right? And I think it took me a while to try and separate the three. And then I was like, I, I don't know if I, if I can do that. Because mm. I, I, I was born this way. This is what I know. So if it's not, if, if not going to be accepted in the spaces I, I, that I occupy, then maybe it's time to venture to new ground. Mm. 
or make my own spaces. And I'm thankful for the experiences that I've had as awful as they have been. Some of them. Um, it has allowed me to understand how I can... Do you know what I mean? Though? Like it, it's, it's, helped me nav- it's helped me understand how I can navigate this industry yeah. in my, in my, within my person and not have to compromise on that. Because the last thing I'm going to do in this industry is compromise because that has got us so far. I find it sad when we have to compromise with the people who know our journey yeah. and the people who have come from our journey and they themselves are doing the same thing that they wouldn't want it to do. Yeah. Like that's what I always find sad. That's, that's and for another chat with Ryan. That's <laughs> another <laughs> um, We're going to move on and talk about some other things, um, which is we'll do some, try and kind of like do some other bits and bobs. But um, I'm going to name some organizations. Mm. And you just tell me what what walk away lessons you've learned from them. Mm. Okay, so Young Vic, Theatre Peckham, okay, Boundless, mm-hmm. Talawa, and also uh, Lyric. Oh, Young Vic, <laughs> Young Vic, remember re, re, to to remember where I come from. Okay, nice, Theatre Peckham. To not be afraid, actually, of being steadfast in what I want and what I expect from an organisation. Nice. Lyric. Oh, yeah. So this is, this is about the, the show. Um, not all skin folk are kin folk. Boundless. Trust that you're in the seat that you're in for a reason, no matter the extenuating circumstances. And trust that if you've been put in a position that you, you know how to navigate. All right, we're going to have one more deep, meaningful conversation. Then you got to fire some good, good old questions. Okay. Black Performance Lab. Yes. I was really interested by that project because we kind of talked about it, but we didn't really dive deep into it when we were talking about it. Mm. And I th- it, and we pre-interview talked about it. Mm. But the question predominantly was that when you're integrating all of these practices and facilitating that to, let's say, emerging talent, because that was an emerging talent program, right? Mm. Mm. Um, how do you navigate and facilitate uh, a practice that you yourself are also trying to figure out? Um, And I'm also intrigued to know how you facilitate that to participants that are not of color. Because I I always find that interesting because you were touching on this before, like in drama schools, right? Mm. And I had recently a guest that they were like, they didn't even know that these companies existed Mm. that are like POCs. They didn't know that that is the work that they were going to be doing. Mm. And to this day, like I go see shows at Rada or Lambda, the end of year shows. And a lot of it is like reconstructed work of like classics, which great, Mm. by all means do that. But I still find it interesting that they come out and they still don't know about practices within who they physically represent yeah. and for what they might be casted in. Mm. So, yeah, I find that fascinating. And I want to know, because you talked about spirituality and you talked about culture and heritage. Yeah. So Black Performance Lab came out of a... So that was a collaboration between myself and the drama school. Mm. The head of movement at the time reached out to me to do a collaborative project for Black History Month in 2022. And at the time, I was really just revisiting my, my dissertations from my undergraduate degree. Um, and I think pretty much all of what I've done since graduating has been due to the fact that I really have unfinished business with my, with my undergraduate degrees. And I was like, you've given me five weeks, you give me two hours a week with these, with these actors in training. What, what can I do? And I, I remember I had studied this book called Black Acting Methods back in university. Not that it had given to me, but because I'm so good at breaking the rules, I just found the book and just did what I wanted to do. Um, and was not concerned about whether or not the faculty were interested in it or not. Anyway, just reading through that, that's sort of been my holy grail in terms of giving me, or just illuminating to me all these different methodologies, for example, that, that, that don't center the, West, the, the, the Western identity or the Western canon. And I was like, okay, I know I'm going into this, into this knowing that I'm also going on a journey with these students. I'm also trying out these methodologies for the first time in person in, in, a, in a practical way. So this is as much for you guys as it is for me. And I made that very clear on the first day. And I think it's, it's, just, it's just common practice for me to go into space just being like, listen, 
if I don't know something, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but this is the impetus for us to go on a journey together. I'm not coming in to purport like I'm an expert in anything because I'm, if anything, lifelong student. Love that for me. And I think what was initially disappointing about that journey was there were, there were only so many students of colour that um, were a part of that. But I mean, this is the UK, so I'm not really surprised at the same time. But what I think was personally gratifying during that pro that during that, that that process was showing or or showing these these students all these all these different methodologies and also providing a platform where they 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 were all they were all new to this mm. they didn't they didn't have to rely on on Brett I, I, I keep bringing them up like rest in peace rest God, in peace all of you I, I love have, Brecht. I just want to say that. I'm sorry. No, I really I do have, love Brecht. I don't have anything against you lot. Rest in peace. Better told Brecht. Um, really nothing against you. Um, I'm sure if I met you, you'd lovely people. No, I don't honestly. I know her. Um, I know her. But yeah, no, I, I wanted this to be just a playground yeah. for all of us. And whilst I come in with, with these, these methodologies, we would just spend time in the studio also asking ourselves the question of who we are, because mm. I think drama schools and training programs actually do us all a disservice by not asking that question and just jumping straight into training without actually giving us time to think about who we are, yeah. our own personal identities, and how through interrogating that, we can come to understand our artistic identities and the kind of works we want to be a part of once we are in the industry. I feel so like Matthew does that. To be fair, I haven't really... You haven't worked with Matt. I haven't you. worked with Matt. Yeah. Shout out to you lot, though. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, most of my classes were, like, yoga-based and breathwork-based because I think without breath, we wouldn't be standing. And I think it's very easy to forget that our body is our, is our first home. So a lot of those sessions were, like, just body work and, and breath work because also these, these students, they'd be coming in from five till seven, um, in the in the evening to do these sessions, so they'd mostly just be tired from the day. Yeah. So I'm also like, I'm I'm a very chill leader because if I'm tired, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a, I'm gonna take my sweet time. Um, <laughs> and so if you're tired, then listen, let's take it slow. But also, we're in this room under the shared purpose of exploring these Afrocentric or Black cultural approaches to theatre making and performance. And a lot of the students that weren't of colour. I think their investment and their willingness to explore and let go a little bit actually restored my faith a little bit. And a lot of them were really, really, really invested in all of these methodologies, like some of the testimonials I received after that. They were like, yeah, I'm going to keep, I'm going to continue like exploring this for the rest of my, my career as an actor. And I'm like, from then I was like, I can die a happy man. That's, that's, that's my mission is for the industry to just think beyond what it knows. I think it's, it's, it's reliance on the safety and security of white supremacist knowledge. AKA Brecht in your head. Not, not even that. <laughs> it's not even that. It's not even that. But I think, I think the industry's security and, and reliance on, on the structures that be really does us all a disservice because theatre has always been a, a, a global art form. And I think it's... I think it's, it's for all of us to, to explore and be uncomfortable and think beyond what we know or what, what we are taught is the right way of being on stage. Um, I just wanted to say this one thing. I also think accessibility is a massive thing. Yeah. Why people like us or not even like us, because there's an expansion mm. of humanity around there. I don't know if that is the right thing to say. Mm. But um, I think there's a reason why we're not even in there because that is not even an accessible thing exactly. for us. Yeah. And I think sometimes systematically, we also have to look in that, that storytelling is a part of who we are. Mm. And that is something that we can do to get bread and butter, yeah. to, have, to have a life, to have a sustainable and viable life. And mm. I think like accessibility is a massive thing. Yeah. So that is one point that I think sometimes organizations, mm. they cannot be faulted for that. Yeah. Um, maybe they can be from a financial perspective, mm. but like that is one thing that I think like as culturally, we have to also kind of like push mm. continuously. Rapid questions. A tip on being financially savvy. 
A tip on being financially savvy. Um, systems. Create systems that work for you. Oh my God, wow, where's this come from? Um, create systems that work for you in terms of like saving and moving your money and making sure your money's liquid and serves you in the best way. If you were to go back to a project, what would it be and why? And if you were to do a part two of it, what would that look like? I'm already working on it. Um, government inspector, I revisit that with a, with a different team. Because like I said, not all skin folk. And what that's looking like is an extended full version of the vision that we created for the Lyric Festival. Nice. What is a lesson that you have learned that you were an assistant producer, an assistant director, and now you are in those executive roles? To take my time. Okay. I learned to take my time, there's no rush. Okay, nice, nice. Um, your favorite thing about yourself, either as a person or as a creative, that you feel like is like the best shit about you, and then something that you feel like is a challenge and are working on? Oh, my favorite thing about me. I'm working on slowing down my mind and being more, I'm a very intentional person. And I think long and hard about, about whether, I'm, whether I'm doing certain projects or just in my, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm just very, I always do things with intention mm -hmm. and with purpose. Um, and I guess that, that's what leads me as a human and as an artist. And I think that's one of my favorite things about me. What was the second thing? Oh, something that you feel like is your beacon, like your, your shit, you're the best at it. Oh, being intentional. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was like a weakness part of that question. Oh, yes, a challenging thing that you're working Challenge. on, which you already um, said that you're working on being patient. Not even that. I think I'm also a... Because I give myself time to think and be intentional, that does lead me down a path of Taking perfectionism. Oh, okay. And uh, what is it like? A paralysis sometimes. So that is my, I think it's any Virgo's biggest challenge is perfectionism. But trusting in the fact that our benchmarks of satisfaction are just, are just higher than others and understanding why that's the case mm -hmm. is something I'm continuing to unpack. Uh, a thing you would like for someone to take away with them, either having known you your entire life or just met you for a brief second. I don't buy. Allure. I, no, I don't buy. I think, I, no, a lot of times when... I meet people, Yeah, they will say that I, I have this allure or that, um, and I understand that I have a resting face, um, <laughs> which is also something that I'm working on, that the record reflect. Um, a lot the of people, letter, it's 12th of June, 239. Please let the record reflect. That is something I'm working on, I promise. <laughs> no, a lot of people do say that they find me intimidating and I'm like, Listen, I don't buy. I'm just an earth sign. We all have the same resting face. But I'm not asking the, case, the question itself. A thing you would like for someone to take away with them, either having known your entire life or not. This is something that you would like them to know that you don't buy it. That's your thing? Yeah. All well, right. that's, 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 right. part, that's, that's... Sure, let's move on. Yeah, I don't buy it. Let's, <laughs> let's keep it at that. A thing you would like to impart on somebody, but you never got told. Oh, gosh. Make these funny, make these humorous, because it's been very deep now. Come on. I just, my, my instinct is just to go deep. I don't know why. Okay, I think I'm so deep. used to being Go deep. deep. Don't Listen, be afraid to, be. to take your time. Say that one more time. <laughs> don't be afraid to take your time. Nice. If you look in the mirror right now, what words of wisdom would you say to your mirror self right now as you pout? I actually wasn't pouting, let the record reflect. It, it was, um, there was a pout there. What words of wisdom would I give to myself? Um, just look in the mirror right now and just say it to yourself. Just keep going. Nice. Uh, three things the creative culture could do with or without. A new government that actually gives a sh Sorry, I was about to... You can swear. Oh, a new government that gives a shit about arts and culture, that funds us in the ways that we need, to refer to the We See You White American Theatre manifesto that came out in 2020. Give us a chance. Give us a chance. Um, three artists whose work you really admire and their journey and would suggest them checking out their work or an organisation. Oh my God, Lan Ray Malaudu, um, he just had Now I See You at Stratford East. That was amazing. Number two, Benedict Lombe, who just wrote Shifters at the Bush. I swear to God, if you said Benedict Cumberbatch, I was coming for your throat. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, shout out to you, if yeah. you're listening. And the last one, have to be theatre related. Nice. Okay, cool. Your thoughts? Uh, no, that we've done. Uh, done that. All right, let's play some games. Quick games. Cool. If you were a movie, what would the original title of that movie be? God damn. 
give me the log line of goddamn. No, that's not the name. No, I'm that just... is the name. That was the first thing that came to oh your head. Oh my god. What give me the log line that will go on IMDb explaining goddamn. And this is about my life. This is about my life. Uh... And that is what it's gonna say, and this is about my life. Nice. Give me three actors that are gonna be in it. Go. Calvin Harrison, Calvin Domingo, Calvin Domingo, and Throwing a woman of colour in there for fuck's sake. Oh my god, of course. Talked about black women so much, not even giving them a shout out. And yet. Heather Ajipong. Nice, thank you. A drink. If you were a drink, what would the original drink be? Or what would, if you were a drink, what would it be? I'm gonna go fancy fruit twist. If you were a food, what dish and cuisine would it be? Las Gambas. They're, um, like, I can't remember. They're just like seasoned prawns um, okay. from Lebanon. So you would go to Lebanon? No, because I had them in Sweden. It was okay. at a Lebanese restaurant. I okay. just love, I love prawns. If you were a fruit, what would it be? Watermelon. If you were a colour, what would you be? Brown. Hello, a clothing item? Oversized onesie. If you Not were... onesie. Um... No, you said it. If you were a flower or a oh, plant, what would you be and which type? First thing, first thing, just say it. Just Dandelion. Say it. Dandelion. Yeah. Nice. What would you rather, cookies or cake? Cake. Rich or fame? Can I say neither? You have to. I have to say one of them. Yeah, go. Uh, rich. Win lots of awards or have an unlimited supply of cash? Unlimited supply. Netflix or Prime? Prime. Fairy tales or mythological stories or real life stories? Real life. World peace or equality? Aren't they synonymous? Choose one. Okay, damn. World peace. Nice, because it leads to equality or mm. without equality. Yeah. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Raving it up or chilling at home? Chilling at home. Improper scripted? Define scripted. Like scripted, like it's all written <laughs> or devised. Devised, improv. <laughs> Big cookouts or intimate dinner party? Oh, love a cookout. Fancy holidays or fancy flights? Fancy holidays because then that implies that I can afford fancy flights. Nice. The next session is called most overrated and underrated. I'm going to list some things and you're going to say who is the most overrated and underrated. Okay. Uh, under, most overrated and underrated actor. Tom Holland. And, uh, what, overrated or underrated? Overrated. Who is underrated? Francesca Amawood Rivers. Shout out. Most overrated and underrated uh, uh, the director. Underrated Devasa, who we trained on... Um, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Over it, we're not going to go into that. <laughs> no, I want to. You don't have to, but like, it'll be nice. I don't know. Sam Mendes, first person that came to mind. Yeah, uh, most overrated and underrated piece of entertainment you have ever watched that includes theatre, like visual art, film, series, anything. Ooh, The Book of Clarence by James Samuel. Or most overrated? Film. Um, underrated. Okay. Please go and see it. Overrated. For black boys. Have you ever is the next section hooked up with a fellow artiste or admirer? Say that again. Have you ever hooked up with a fellow artiste or an admirer? Let's move on. With. <laughs> Have you ever flirted to get ahead? No. Lies. Have you ever okay, joined the My no, Mind let's, Club? Let's, let's Have you it. ever joined? Let's, no. Have right. you ever? We ain't got time. We've got like thirty minutes. Have you ever joined the My High Club or done anything intimate after this? For the record, to reflect, we will get into this off recording. Um, <laughs> have I ever no? What my high club? Was that the question? <laughs> wow! Was that I, the question? I mean, like I have. I don't understand why people. Feel what was like, the question? My, have you ever joined the my high club or done anything intimate public? Oh, not my high club. No. But, but the other part, we we we. <laughs> have I, you ever peed while swimming? No. Really? Wow! Forgotten the words and made it up on the spot. To what? Like, to off a script or a show or a film. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Have you et uh, ever eaten within a couple of seconds of something dropping on the floor or in the bin? Yes. Nice. Okay, two more segments and then you're ready to go. You gotta go, you gotta go. Cool. Ready? Section four is called Opposites Attract. We're gonna do two things that are gonna be opposites. Mm -hmm. One is a rant, mm -hmm. okay? So everybody loves a rant. You love a rant, I love a rant. You get to rant for 30 seconds about anything and everything you want. However, you must start or end your rant with what the chai. Do you feel like you've got something to rant about? I think I'm all ranted out, I'm not gonna lie. Well, think of a rant. In three, two, one, Geordie. What the time? Taking people in the industry, here's my rant. Um, I think it's sick, I think it's twisted, I think this industry is incredibly incestuous. 
Um, I think it's gross how many people have dated each other within one degree of separation. Um, like, I, do, I, I, I have, I will never be dating within this industry ever again. Um, what the child? What the child? You still got what 10 seconds child? left. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. Just don't, I agree with you, don't date within the industry. Yeah. You can do other things within the industry, like meet for a shag, go for a kiss. Like, do, do I don't even think do that. that. I just think don't date, don't, like, unless it, re- like, there's very, very rarely does it work out for you. Anyway. As I've, as I've learned. As you have learned. Joyfulness is the other section of this, hence why opposites attract. What is one thing that makes you, Geordie, feel joyful? And what is one thing you do for others that makes them feel joyful? Oh my God, being alone. <laughs> I love my own company. Yes, you do. Um, I, I, I just love being with myself and doing things like yoga and meditation um, and watching Jerry Springer on Amazon Prime. <laughs> no, I love it. I've even got into like this really dangerous obsession with people versus food on That's a YouTube. good one. That's it's a good really one. good. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I literally stayed up until like four last night just like watching random people versus food episodes on YouTube. Yeah. Um, it's great. Love being alone. That's one thing that brings me joy. One thing that... I do for others to make them feel joyful. Oh my God, listen, I think it's a rarity in this day and age that people actually understand like active listening um, and listening to comprehend and offering considerate communication and being authentic in terms of transparency and vulnerability. That's something that I, I try to give as much as possible. Well, everyone, that brings us to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed that. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so you never miss out. And don't forget to rate and comment on whichever platform you're listening to this episode on. You can also become a patron and a supporter of the show by subscribing for as small as £5 or as I love saying, $5.50 on Patreon. I will put the information of the artist on the episode and any of the links in the description of this episode, so make sure to check that out. But as of now, I will leave you as I always do. Breathe in and breathe out. (sighs) Now must go, which means now I must go. That is copyrighted and I will sue. (laughs) Until next time, stay curious.